We're going to look at the life of Samuel today, but I do want to acknowledge that is, uh, when Samuel's mother is mourning, weeping, because she doesn't seem to be able to have a, a child, and the husband says to her, aren't I enough, baby? Right? Aren't, here, I'll give you two servings of steak. Isn't that enough? It, it, yeah. But things not to say to a wife. Bad idea. Today we're going to look at the life and times of Samuel, the only person in Scripture who is both a judge and a prophet. He was dedicated to the service of God by his mother before he was born, and lifelong Nazarite. The razor never touched his head, he never drank wine. And so when he was young, he was sent to Shiloh, which is where the nation of Israel gathered to worship. He was raised by Eli, the priest who was in charge of Shiloh. Now, when he was young, something happens that we are, we, we, the story we probably uh, know best about him when he is uh, going to sleep and a voice calls to him and he goes to Eli and says, yeah, what do you want? And uh, Eli says, go to bed. And, uh, and then he goes, goes back to bed and it happens a second time and, and Eli goes, seriously, kid, go to bed. Uh, uh, Everyone who's been a parent knows this sensation, right? Seriously, just to sleep. And um, the third time comes back, and oh, this might be something more. And, and so Eli is able to say, this, this must be God speaking. Plus, Eli probably, probably took three times for him to fully wake up, for him to realize what's happening. So he says, this must be God speaking next time. Don't stop coming and getting me. I want to sleep tonight. And, and say, I, I am listening. And so Samuel does this, and uh, this is the story, and here's, here, here could be the punchline of the sermon, right? We need to have mentors in the faith to help us see what we don't know that we're seeing, to interpret, to understand, right? The idea of having a good mentor is a wonderful thing. That, make, that makes a great punchline for a sermon. But we've got to keep on going, because his life keeps on unfolding. We can't stop there. got to keep on going. And so he said, God says, I'm going to do something that's going to cause the ears of those who hear to tingle. Right? This is going to be something shocking. And what has happened is uh, judgment has been declared on the two, son, two sons of Eli. You see, Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons, they're bums is what it boils down to. They take bribes and uh, they are, uh, whenever you go to the temple and you you offer something, the sacrifice to God, the, the best piece of meat you put on the altar. You put the filet up here, and then the priest needs to eat something, so the priest makes sure to grab a pound of hamburger. And what Hophni and Phineas are doing is saying, no, you've got to put the hamburger up here, because I want the filet. And even when people are coming and saying, but that's not how it's supposed to go, they're threatening and saying, if you don't do it this way, we're going to get our filet, or else you're not going to make a sacrifice. So this is bad, right? And so <laughs> it has been declared that they are doomed and they will die on the same day. Here's a nice little uh, punchline as well. Don't take what's God's and like, don't be like Hophni and Phinehas. We could use that for the whole sermon. Uh, that what is God's and, and don't take it. But the story keeps on unfolding. You've got to keep on following Samuel. And the leaders of the 12 tribes, they get together, and without consulting God, without prayer, without going to Shiloh, uh, without asking if it's the right thing to do, they go and they invade the Philistine uh, country. They, and, and the Philistines have been raiding, taking their farmlands, so they invade, and they get whooped. They just get whooped. And so they go back and they say, let's go get our secret weapon. They go back and they say, let's get the ark. They, they think that if they bring the ark with them, they have to win. And uh, Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons, see no problem with this. They go along. They say, this is a great idea. And um, Eli, at this point, is notably absent. Eli, the guy who's in charge, in theory, either sees his sons do it, and, and after a lifetime of letting them do what they want, lets them do what they want one more time, or they pull a fast one and they, they sneak the ark out when their dad's not looking. This is going to end poorly, you can tell, isn't it, right? And, and so the Jewish tribes go back for the rematch, and the Philistines are scared because they know that the other side has the ark, and with the ark, that's the secret weapon, and so they're fighting God, and so they fight for their lives, and, and when you corner someone and they fight for their lives, they have a funny way of fighting harder, and they win. And so Hophni and Phinehas, they die on the same day in this battle. 
And the Philistines take the ark back, and Israel is terrified, and the Philistines are triumphant, except everywhere they put the ark, people start getting sick, and, and the crops aren't coming in, and they realize, this is bad, we need to send it back. And so they send the ark back, they, they put it on some cattle, they aim on a cart, they aim it back towards Israel, and they... They, 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 if the cattle will take the ark back to Israel, it must have belonged there. They don't do anything, and, and the, they, the, they pull, the cart starts moving and pulls it back to Israel. And so there are some people who are uh, there in Israel, and, and they see a cart being pulled, pulled by some oxen, pulling a, the, and they see the ark, and they say, Huh, what is that? And they go up to the ark, and they open the ark. And has anyone here seen Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark? This is what that's based off of. Like, they open the ark, and the scriptures tell us they die. Now, it does not tell us that their faces melt off like wax dummies, like the figures in the special effects of Raiders and the Lost Ark, that might have haunted me for years after watching them as a young teen. But, this, it's scriptural, there might have been some artistic license on how it happens, but it's there in the Bible. Don't open the ark or you'll die. Another great punchline for, for a, a sermon, don't you think? But we've got to keep on going, because the, the story keeps on moving. Samuel gathers the tribes together, and now Eli... So, when uh, the messengers come back and tell Eli that his sons have died, Eli falls over. He's an old man. He falls, he trips, and he breaks his neck, and, and he dies. And so, when the ark comes back, Eli is dead. His sons are dead. The only person left to run the, the, the temple is uh, Samuel. So, Samuel calls the tribes together, invites them to turn back to God to, turn, to tear down the shrines to false gods and he gathers them to pray and as this is happening they hear that the Philistines are invading again and they pray help and um, they gather to go up to battle and a thunderstorm uh, sweeps in and goes over the Philistines and scatters them and so they, they're, the Israelites win the battle and, and they have peace and so this is the point at which Samuel sort of comes into his own and he becomes the, the judge, the sort of ro roving, um, the roving sheriff, so to speak, of Israel. And he, he rides a circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mitzpah to Ramah, and that's his circuit. He rides the, the length of the land, and whenever he would show up, he would ask, okay, is there anything that needs to be uh, mediated, worked out, figured out, right? Yeah, I'm here to make sure that, that things are going to go well. And, and this, is the, this is the point which Samuel is, is sort of running the country to a degree. And, and here's another punchline for a sermon, right? Right? Always pray before starting something. Always pray before doing something important. And, and that's a good punchline. But the story is still unfolding. Because we turn the page and we read that Samuel grows old. Happens, doesn't it? Right? Samuel grows old. And no longer able to travel that circuit from Bethel to Gilgal to Mitzpah to Ramah. He has two sons. And he'll send out the two sons, Joel and Abijah. If any of you know in Scripture a son that is as righteous or as good or as honest as the father, please tell me, because I can't think of a single one. If you look at the sons, Gideon, one of the previous sons, his, his, one of the previous judges, his son, Abimelech, is a bum. Eli, who we just heard about, he has two sons, and they're bums. And now we have Samuel, and he has two sons. And they start riding the circuit that their, his, their father had run, and they accepted bribes and perverted justice, and, and they're bums, right? How is it that Samuel, who is a judge because Eli, the previous judge, and his two sons, they, they went through that. Eli's sons didn't live up to the father's standards, and they weren't honest, they cheated others, and then he has his own two sons that end up doing the same thing. I find this to be one of the more depressing moments in the stories of Scripture when Samuel repeats the mistakes of his mentor. And maybe this is a, where you need to modify one of the earlier potential punchlines for the sermon, right? That everyone needs a mentor. Everyone does need a mentor. But no mentor is perfect. Right? No mentor is perfect, and please try not to repeat their mistakes. Maybe that's something worth saying. 
So the tribes send their leaders to Samuel, and, and they've had enough. Like, they had Eli and his two sons, and that didn't work out. Eli was good, the sons, eh. Right? And Samuel, you are good, but your two sons, not working out so well. And we're tired of this. The tribes get together to tell Samuel, we need to do something different. We want a king. Right? We want a king. Give us a king. And so Samuel looks at them and tells them what having a king is going to mean. He tells them that the king, 1 Samuel 8, will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifty, some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his, courts, to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give it to his officers. He will take your male and female slaves, the best of your cattle, your donkeys, and put them to work. He will take one-tenth of your flock and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, we are determined to have a king over us, so that we might be like other nations, that our king might govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he repeated them to God, and God said to Samuel, Listen to their voice and set a king over them. It's an interesting moment in Scripture. Right? Saul, or, uh, Samuel goes out and appoints the first king, Saul. And Saul is an interesting person. Is Saul the unexpected king from the tribe of Benjamin? So something like, you, you don't know where you're going to find your leaders. Don't be surprised. Or, or Saul, you could look at it and say, Saul is the, the person you expect to be king because he is the tall, uh, mighty warrior. And he's, he, does a, he looks exactly like, he lo it's like he's sent from central casting. If you ask for a king, you'd get Saul. Tall, handsome, dark-haired, right? And, uh, and he whiffs. So don't, ex don't expect what you, don't, don't always think that what you see is what you're going to get. The story of Saul is a different sermon. But what we do know is that Samuel, having appointed the king, doesn't just fade away. He takes up a new role, and for the first time, there is a prophet. Samuel is the last judge, and he is the first prophet. And the prophet is the guy who goes up to the king. The king who's in charge of everything. The prophet is the one who goes up to the king and says, Now listen here, buddy. That's not what God wants. Now that's the prophet's role. The prophet is the person who shows up to the king and says, this is not what God wants. And it, this is the, this, the structure that will be in place for centuries now. The king will be in charge and God will send prophets to make sure the king doesn't do anything too crazy. And, and maybe this is another nice punchline for a sermon. That Samuel, uh, he doesn't just appoint the king, but then he changes roles that times change and you change with them. Like Samuel doesn't say, I've always been a judge and I can't, I can't do anything else. Like that's how it's always been done. That's just the way it's always been done. He says, no, I can do something new. Right? And times change and change with them. That's an interesting punchline for a sermon. After this, Samuel mopes a bit until God prods him, sends him out to appoint David to be the next king. And then as far as we know, Samuel dies, and uh, that's the last we hear of him, except for one very weird moment when Saul, who gets uh, the first king, who gets very desperate, he goes to the witch at Endor. And he speaks to the witch and says, I want to speak to Samuel one more time. He always was honest with me. And, and the spirit of Samuel shows up and tells Saul, man, if you were a goner before, now you are definitely a goner. That's my personal translation of it. But it gets the point across, right? And, and I don't know what to make of that story either. But that's the life and times of Samuel. And, it, you know, and with all of that story, I could take pieces of it and I could tell you the story of Samuel, that he is one of the, the pivotal transitional leaders and he was amazing because he led the people from being the tw 12 tribes to the one kingdom and, and he changed roles and he went from being the judge to being the prophet. And so he is an amazing exemplar of Christian leadership and we need to be just like that. Or I could, I could tell the story of 
Samuel that he is a bum, right? He saw the sins of Eli in the way that he raised two children that caused problems, and then he did the same thing, right? And, and that he was, that caused so much problems that the nation turned away from the judges and went to the, the king, and the king, King Saul, never panned out. Like, I could, I could tell you the story of Samuel, and he is an amazing hero of the faith. I could tell you the story of Samuel, and he, he's the person you least want to be like. I could tell you either sermon, either story, but that's, either one would be incomplete because life's not that simple. You can't, can't caricature them. It doesn't work. Like, I could go through and pick out punchlines, uh, the sort of punchlines of sermons all over the place from his life, but it's important to have a mentor in the faith. Don't take what's God's. Pray before starting something. Don't open the ark. Right? Mentors make mistakes, so, so respect them, but don't, you don't have to be just like them. That, that times change, and, and we change with them. Like You can take individual punchlines from the various parts of his life, but Samuel's entire life cannot be reduced to one line. No life can. It is complicated. He is a complicated person having moments of amazing faith. He's the first prophet to stand up to a king of Israel. He also had moments of amazing failure. His sons, woo baby, that did not work out well. Samuel's life is a life that's not reducible to one simple lesson and one simple refrain. His life is complex, and I believe it's important to appreciate and celebrate that. And I think it's important to do so because our lives are similarly complex. Mixes of faith and doubt, strength and struggle, just as Samuel's was. We can be graceful to him, respecting him, knowing that he was not perfect, and hopefully we can, be, we can learn to do so with ourselves. Some of us are very hard on ourselves. Some of us are our own worst enemies. We can be graceful with ourselves. We don't have to beat ourselves up for being le something less than perfect and completely consistent. We are always striving to be more like Christ, but we're not perfect. And no one in Scripture, none of the people in Scripture are. The Bible is full of examples, not of God using perfect people, but of God working through imperfect people like Samuel and like us. You don't have to be perfect to follow Jesus and help build his kingdom. You just have to be willing. We are called to be graceful with ourselves, and this also calls us to be graceful with others. Especially in this time when everyone knows everything, it seems. Social media, news, 24-hour news. It, a couple years ago, about two years ago now, Martin Luther King Jr., a preacher who I greatly respect, he had a few children. You remember what his children were arguing about about two to three years ago? Right? His youngest daughter has... Martin Luther King Jr.'s Bible and Nobel Peace Prize. His, like, Bible, the one he preached from, the one that Obama, like, became a president swearing on. Kind of a big deal. And a few years ago, back in 2016, his children got into a knockdown, throwdown, ended up in the courts. They had to have a judgment because the oldest brother wanted to sell it all. Right? Doesn't that just bother you? Like Martin Luther King Jr., he, he raised some children who ended up fighting over whether they can sell his Bible and Nobel Peace Prize. Martin Luther King Jr., like Samuel, not perfect. Right? If you, follow, you read the life of his, his life, he ain't perfect. But he was a leader and he followed Jesus. To be graceful with people, to be graceful with Samuel, to be graceful with ourselves, to be graceful with those who lead, not expecting perfection, but expecting devotion and honesty. I think we can do that. No one's going to be perfect, but people can be devoted. And so we strive to be graceful with ourselves. Let us also be, strive to be graceful with others, with our neighbors, our co-workers, our bosses, our employees, our family. For they, like Samuel, are amazing mixes of beauty and frustration, brilliance and obtuseness. My friends, I don't have a simple take-home for you today because Samuel's life wasn't simple. Like, if, you, if someone asks you when you go home, what was the sermon about? All, you really can't, like, I, I don't know what to tell you. What was the sermon about? Well, it was complicated because that's how life is. 
If you, you can only remember one thing, one simple thing from this, this, here, I'll give it to you. Here's the best I can do. If you find the ark, don't open it. <laughs> Amen. 